Oh, hello there. How'd you get in my house? Well, since you're here, I'm going to talk to you about something. So this book, this is a book I remember getting out from my local library back when I was a teenager. And it's how to build your own 80286 IBM compatible and save a bundle. This book was written basically when the IBM PS2s had come out, they were super expensive, and before OS2 had come out. So there's a period of time there where people wanted computers that were going to run the new operating system, but they didn't want to spend a chunk of change on an IBM 286. But with this sitting on my shelf, it's got me a little bit inspired, and that was to build a 286, not necessarily of this era, but a 286 in the 90s. Um, one thing we forget is when you think early 90s computer, we, we were just think 486, but no, in the early 90s, especially here in New Zealand, you could still go out and buy a brand new XT if you wanted. It was really defined by your budget. So I thought it would be neat to build a cheap 286, you know, something that's not in a big case, it's in a relatively compact case, it was modern tech, but it was 286 for low value. And what was great about that was um, Terry from the Classic Computer Forums over in New Zealand, you guys may know him as Tezza, and he's a good fellow, and he came around here and he actually dropped off a Morse 28612 from exactly this time period. And it's a beautiful motherboard with a really great diagnostics utility built in, and I love it. So I was using it as my workbench testing thing. You get your old hard drives in, I'd just slap them into that Morse 286 and away they went. But it wasn't actually in a case, and that felt a bit rude because that motherboard was in fantastic condition. So it needed a case. And I had a spare case sitting in the garage, but I wasn't too sure what machine to put in it. Do I put a 286 in it? Do I put a 386 in it? It, it was that early 90s style, and the cheapest style. Originally I pulled the 386 SX out of it, um, but it had so much rust damage, the motherboard was just completely unrecoverable. Um, I had to actually drill out rusted screws to get the original hard drive out, which had completely seized. It was a disaster, but the case itself actually survived, once it cleaned a bit of the rust out. But the point of the story is, I was browsing through a 1992, I think it's 92, 1991 actually, PC World New Zealand. You see it's talking about the new 386 options, which down here were costing quite a few thousands of dollars if you wanted a 386. So we go to the next page, and this first computer here, you just see him over here. $2,000. And it's a Unitron, which is the exact case I had sitting in the garage. Fantastic. And it was a 28612 uh, with a 20-meg hard drive or a 40-meg upgrade and VGA. That's basically everything I had in the garage. And when we're talking about this, how to save a bundle business, I thought, well, how about this time, instead of going and using my good tested parts or nice stuff, why don't I see what stuff I've got left lying around in the workshop that most people would consider junk, but maybe I could make work in a system. And so that's what I had a crack at. Have a look. Alright, so we're just starting with the RAM here. Now I'm just installing another 4 megs in the SIM slots here, but this motherboard would actually come with 1 megabyte standard, which is perfect because it actually matched our advert at the start of the video. There's the 4 megs and the 1 meg chips there, so it gives us a total of 5 megs, which is perfect for you know, like Windows 3.1, that sort of stuff. It's going to run great. Now one of the first problems I had with this machine is I'd only ever run it with CGA or MDA cards. I never actually tried putting a VGA card in it. And none of them would post. I just could, this motherboard would not start with a VGA card installed. And I was just, 16 cards in total I went through. I mean, it was ridiculous. Um, I even tried another power supply. It, it just didn't help at all. It made no difference. I mean, I was worried something was wrong with the motherboard. I tried cards even from 1995, like this Realtek here. Nothing would work. But I eventually got it to post. And it turned out Trident 8900 series with the FIFO buffer enabled worked flawlessly. Why? Not completely sure. I'm guessing it has something to do with the way it performs the test. I was a little bit paranoid that there was something wrong with the machine that was causing the fault. So I went through and did some video diagnostics. Now this is a tool that's built into this motherboard, which is just really awesome. Um, it's unfortunate that you, it's the sort of utility you use once and then you'll never go back to it, but I just love the fact that it's there. So I took a little bit of time here, and you can see the video tests are going through just fine. Um, I believe we might be missing a few pixels on the right, but that's because of my upscaler. There's not much I can do about that. But thinking about the motherboard, I mean, if you looked at some of the shots earlier, you would have noticed there's a problem soldered right to it that I haven't dealt with yet. And that's this guy here. 
the NICAD battery, which actually still perfectly holds its charge. It hasn't leaked out. There's nothing wrong with it. But at some stage, it's going to have to go. So now's a good time. Now, usually I just clip these off and hook up an external. But I just bought a new desoldering station, and I wanted to try it out. So let's give that a whirl. I just power it up. And once it's warmed up, we're ready to go. Now for a fairly low cost desoldering station, I was very happy with the result. This battery came straight out, and I'll just lift up the motherboard here and you'll be able to see just like the the through hole solder is completely gone. I could easily install another component there. Minimal fuss, no damage to the board. Very happy with that. Now, for the actual external battery, I actually like using CD-ROM connectors because you can often get them in bulk from recyclers really cheaply and they just fit perfectly on that battery connector there. And as a rule, I use the red wire for my positive. And just so I'm gonna do the attachment here. Now I'm just cutting a little bit of heat shrink and putting that on the wires before I solder it made that mistake a few times um, and I am using alkaline batteries here which is probably a bit of a thing I need to reconsider the reason I'm using that is because I like to use three 1.5 volt cells gives me four and a half volts which is a safe voltage that I can use on pretty much all of my computers that need an external battery without having to worry about anything but something like a lithium coin cell may be a smarter choice um, because alkaline batteries eventually will leak but this is going to be remotely mounted inside the case and the box that contains the battery is sealed so I'm okay with it for the meantime it's been working well for me and you know I check my machines out once a year so I don't see it actually being a problem for the machines in my storage but if you're going to store it for 10 or 20 years you should probably come up with something a little bit better than alkaline and just going to tighten up that heat shrink here but the only use I have for my hot air gun. I actually found with SMD soldering quite often it was actually just easier to use the iron than it was the hot air gun, so it doesn't see a lot of use. There we go, now we can put it on. So pin 1 is your positive there, and you usually got the key in pin 2. Some other boards will use a jumper between pins 2 and 3 um, that needs to be removed when you're using the external battery. It's one thing to keep an eye on. Uh, so now I'm just doing the front panel connectors. A lot of this is just really self-explanatory stuff. If you get an LED in the wrong way, just turn it around. Key lock is the only one that's weird, and pins 1 and 2, that's your power LED. Um, I actually made that mistake when I was building this machine, and I first started hooking all the connectors up, got them in the wrong spot. I also put in a cable tie there just to keep things nice and clean. And hooking up the power supply connectors there for more testing. Now you see the feet in the machine. This is one of the downsides to using leftovers in your garage as opposed to getting good bits. And you'll see the feet there are in really bad shape. And they're actually supposed to be in the motherboard. Um, they're in there because I couldn't quite make that work. So that's just a little work around there. So I've got the motherboard installed now. And I'm just before I do the last screw, because there is a screw in the corner, I'm just getting an ISA card installed first just to make sure that everything's lined up straight and sitting right. All looks good. So I start putting in some cards now. This is an Interland network card and it's 10 base 2 which is what I use um, for my vintage network so that's perfectly fine by me. Next thing that's going in is a Sound Blaster Pro which doesn't suit the machine build but we're just going to pretend that a few years later somebody slotted it in. Now I'm using a Sound Blaster Pro 2 because it doesn't require software to set it up. This is a really good card and I've got a few of them. Now this thing was the biggest pain in my bum of the day. Um, this really sketchy IDE controller. These cards almost never fail. So the fact that it had rust on it and it looked like junk really didn't concern me because I've, I've never seen these cards fail. Um, but it did give me a ton of headaches and it ended up coming out of the machine. But here's me installing it anyway. I'm just doing up this back panel here. And there, that's pretty much going to be the end of that. Right, now is also a good time to make sure your hard drive LED is hooked up. It's an easy thing to forget. Now I just cheated a little bit there and used a multimeter to work out which way around it goes, but if you get it wrong, just flip it around the other way. Um, it's not that big of a deal, but yeah, while you're in there, it's a good idea to do it now. Now the first problem I had here is a machine wouldn't post. Luckily it turned out to be this stupid network card. Um, the good news about that was I had a spear, as you'll see in a second. So now we're posting, go back, and hey, can't even tell the difference. It's the exact same model of card, same jumpers, 
there's no reason for it, there's something wrong with it. And this is when we started to discover the problems with the IDE controller. I went through drive after drive before finally giving up and changing to this guy. Now this guy has all of his features enabled, it's able to find the jumpers on Chulak, which is really handy. You see we've got the bus mouse turned off because I'm not going to use that. Okay, so we've got our hard drive detected and running, just going to start putting the floppy drives in now. Now there's no rails on these machines, so it's the typical thing of positioning it and then fluffing around the screws to try and get the thing to line up perfectly at the front. I really do miss the rail system that was in the IBM ATs, it was actually pretty good. Now I'm keeping the 1.2 meg drive as my A drive, keeping it up top, so I think that's pretty standard for the time. Your DOS system discs were probably on five and a quarter inch still, and the three and a half inch floppy would have been something you added on later, just for getting new software or game titles and that sort of stuff. So that's the B drive. And just lining these screws up. You gotta be fairly careful, just to make sure your front of the machine looks nice. And there's our cabling, you see the B drive is A there with a little twisted connector up top, it's nothing too special. Let's give it a power up and just uh, see how those drives are doing. Yeah, that's not sounding too good, so we're going to have to do something about that. Oh god, make it stop. That's horrible. Anyway, quite often with a lot of these drives, what ends up happening is the lubricant dries up and then it starts to attract dust and then the heads end up getting stuck, so you just got to give them a bit of a clean. Now I do want to mention here, if you are using an older drive like a 360K or something like that, or something um, that's not a Panasonic 1.2 meg, you probably shouldn't just jump in and rip it apart like this. It's just that I've done a few of these drives now and I know this procedure works. And here you can see our problem right there down the bottom. And the other thing to look for is that little spinning gear there for moving the head, but I'm pretty sure that spot right there is our issue. So we're just going to give that bar a clean, and I'm just going to strip the drive right down. Anyway, as I was mentioning with those older drives, you've got to be careful that you don't screw up the alignment and stuff like that. And in this drive, it seems pretty fixed. It's pretty hard to um, throw it out of alignment. I've done this probably on three or four Panasonic 1.2 meg drives. It's just not a problem at all. I might uh, do a separate video on how to do this at some stage if people are having trouble with these drives, but it's it's fairly common sense. You just have to pay attention to how the mechanism works. And the main thing here is, is to get that bar that it slides along, to get that as polished as possible so it's completely slippery. And I've used a bit of isopropyl and I'm just going to give it a bit of a polish there with a uh, tissue. It's not the cleanest tissue in the world, but it's going to work for this job. and just working it through the mechanism, getting that alcohol in there to just get everything all loosened up. And once you've finished with this, the head should just fall. So if you hold it up, it shouldn't stick, it should just glide like this, it'll just drop. If that's the case, then you've done a good job of the polish, and you can reassemble the drive. So, time to put this back together, and let's see what it's like now. Just wait for the system to start up and do our floppy seek and see how we go. That's so much better. And if you're wondering, yep, the drive red disc's absolutely fine. Also at this stage I realised this whole video you guys haven't been able to hear any beeps and that's because the cable had fallen off the bottom of the PC speaker sometime long ago so I'm just taking a quick second to solder that back up and now you should be able to hear some beep Hear the RAM test There it is, and now we're going to boot up DOS. Now this is the next part of the story. So that hard drive that I had screwed into the bottom of the case in the fairly inaccessible location that is the bottom drive bay, uh, turns out it won't write. Um, the drive detects fine, I can read it fine, I can view the partitions in F-Disk, but I was completely unable to write to this disk. Now this is only going to be a short clip here, but I spent... <laughs> quite a lot of time doing this, 
and I went through a whole bunch of spare drives that I had laying around the workshop. Now the trouble is with workshop drives is often you pull them out of the machines that are dead or they don't work. And so I was going through a lot of drives and having failures, crashed heads, all sorts of stuff. But then this happened. And when this, I've never had an IDE drive do this, but to me this was a sign from the gods to give up for the day. I needed to go and have a coffee and I was done. But I knew you guys would want to see inside the drive, so let's just see what actually went bad in this drive. So I found the culprit pretty quickly. It's just a tantalum capacitor. It's gone short circuit, melted everything around it. Now to work out those components, I'm going to have to pull another one of those drives apart. Um, but I can actually repair that. Anyway, this led me to just go to the storage unit and get my good parts. So at the box right at the bottom of that stack, I was able to find some 40 meg goodness. We ended up coming away with a Quantum 40AT and an ST157A. So next weekend, I'm going to try those drives out, and part two will be coming up very soon. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.